Uh, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so nice to be here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank, of course, uh, Professor Chen um, for the very, very um, kind introduction and uh, his invitation. And uh, also the Glories and Global Network for Buddhist Studies and Frog Bear for sponsoring um, this event and my visit. And um, last but not the least, um, our you know, really awesome Frog Bear stuff, um, Vicky Baker and Carol Lee for organizing my visit. Um, so as Professor Chen just mentioned, um, the title for my talk today is uh, Educational Modernization in Chinese Buddhism. Uh, roughly a century of transformation. Uh, it is indeed based on um, this manuscript that uh, I recently completed, which is based on my doctoral dissertation. Um, so I actually haven't, you know, really been speaking, you know, about that project for a while now because the idea is to kind of move on from it, right? So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so very happy to, you know, uh, come back and, and, and try and sort of, you know, rethink many of the issues and to share with you um, some findings that I have. Um, so the 20th century uh, or turn of the 20th century in China uh, was a really tumultuous time. We're talking about the end of imperial rule, the threats of you know various foreign powers, and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> the for the intellectuals and as well as political elite during this time, um, reform um, was sort of like central right, to everyone's thoughts uh, in sort of like you know getting China out of I guess you know this. Uh, very tumultuous time in, you know, strengthening itself in uh, uh, sort of like facing all the challenges posed by, um, you know, foreign threats and also the challenges of modernity. Um, so, and very central to like the reform projects in the early 20th century um, was education. Uh, we're talking about the introduction of mass education. Uh, across the country, um, to the degree that right, you have this kind of slogan, "Jiao Yu Jiu Guo," or "Save the Nation Through Education." It was thought that only a modern, mass, popular education available to all would be able to produce for China a citizenry right, that would sort of like, you know strengthen the nation. Um, and, 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 and grow and, you know, and prosper. Um, from the perspective of religion, though, ironically, this national educational reform project was done at the expense of religion. We're talking about a very a weakening state, uh, where you know infrastructures, you know, were not you know equitably funded, and so on and so forth. So, in order to just you know have the kind of resources necessary to even fund and house uh, um, public education, reformers, politicians, local elites naturally perhaps turned to religion and went. Here is a piece of land that we can confiscate. Right here are some resources, right, that we can snatch, and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, then, right, this national project, you know, was done, I guess, you know, with religion sort of like in mind, right, in terms of you know funding it and 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 and, and so on. Um, some scholars argue that as a response to this, the Buddhists came up with something parallel, right, that says. Well, only education right, would be able to revitalize Buddhism, you know, so that it would survive into the modern time. Um, sums up in the slogan "Jiao Yu Xing Jiao," revitalize Buddhism through education. However, I would say that it is wrong to conclude that the Buddhists only wanted to avoid confiscation of temple properties um, when. They advocated right, for a uh, new style education. Okay. Um, so I would argue that they actually genuinely 
and enthusiastically wanted to, number one, um, become active and engaged citizen for the you know, uh, new nation state. And number two, they also wa wanted to place Buddhism or reformulate Buddhism um, as an integral element of the social and political life of modern China. Mm -hmm. um, and here's you know, the last slogan uh, for this slide here. So if during this same period, we have the Buddha saying that once Buddhism is revitalized, it will be able you know, to serve as a moral force right, um, to save the nation. And hence the slogan, Save the Nation with Buddhism or Jiao Yu Jiu Guo. Um, and therefore, uh, Buddhist education also um, went through a very foreign period of growth and significant changes starting from um, the very early uh, 1900s, but especially in the 1920s and the 1930s. Okay. So my own work then um, was an attempt to really investigate and evaluate the kind of changes taking place at this time um, and also you know, to study this very convergence of identity, institution, and politics during this very particular um, historical um, context. So <clears throat> starting from the 1900s, um, various types of Buddhist schools started to get founded. Um, some of them only lasted a very short time, uh, and then, you know, with new ones being founded, um, some of them were founded to provide education for um, just, you know, young children, boys usually, uh, who are not monks. And eventually, you know, you see the emergence of monastic schools. So in other words, right, the Buddhists were saying, in order to revitalize Buddhism and to save the nation, you need a very different clergy. Right? And these new style schools would produce for China a modern, scientifically minded um, clergy. Right? So um, my own work then, aside from, I guess, providing you know, a history for this uh, uh, development of Buddhist education, um, my own research focuses on the emergence of a particular type of Buddhist institution called the Fo Xue Yuan, uh, Buddhist academies, or sometimes translated as Buddhist seminaries. Okay. Um, the first of such Buddhist educational institution that took the name Fo Xue Yuan uh, was the one founded by um, the reformist monk Tai Xu. Uh, in the middle of the picture here, in Wuchang in 1922. At first, right, it only calls itself Fo Xue Yuan, as you can see, right, because it was the only one and the first one in China. And eventually, over time, as other um, Buddhist academies started to emerge, right, I mean, people started to call it the Wuchang Fo Xue Yuan or the Wu Yuan as an abbreviation. So. Um, the Wuchang Fo Xue Yuan was founded in 1922 um, <clears throat> by Tai Xu. One thing that is, I think, important to note here is that it was founded actually with lay support outside of um, the traditional monastic institution. So it wasn't part of any monastery. They actually acquired um, you know, um, a, the, the residence right, of a prominent uh, 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 a merchant and turn this into an academy. Okay. So um, much work has been done on the reformist project of Tai Xu himself. And uh, so <clears throat> there's you know, uh, various books available and the most recent one by Justin Ritzinger. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to re repeat um, the reformist thoughts and the life and the career of Tai Xu. This particular book project itself focuses on um, the identity formation of everyone else <laughs> uh, that you see in this picture, namely the students. Okay? The students that these institutions produced and the students who 
I think, um, really contributed to um, the emergence of a different way of imagining a national Buddhist identity, um, the student monks. So I will return to the student monks, um, you know, in a few minutes. Um, so <clears throat> very sh shortly after the founding of Wu Chang, you started to see the emergence of other institutions that started to call themselves Fu Xue Yuan um, across different parts of China. Okay. Um, it's an incomplete count, but between 1911 and 1949, you know, throughout China, I counted something like 124, 25 schools. I probably have missed quite a few of them. And as you can see, right, I mean, the majority of them, you know, concentrated in you know, the lower Yangtze River, the historical stronghold um, of Buddhism. Um, you know, quite a few in Sichuan and so on and so forth. Um, so, in other words, very shortly, right, and especially into um, the late 1920s and early 1930s, you start to see right, um, Fu Xue Yuan more or less flourishing, um, you know, all around China. Um, the Wu Chang Fu Xue Yuan only lasted a, number, a few years. Um, tai Xu was only the director for two years, and then he abruptly left. Uh, you know, not to dwell too much on um, that part of the history. Um, the Wu Chang compared to other Buddhist academies, like the ones that Tai Xu founded. You know, um, in Fujian and you know, uh, in other parts of China, it was actually pretty short-lived. Okay, but in the narrative of uh, modern Chinese Buddhism. Wu Chang occupies a very, very, very important place. Okay. Um, in other words, it provided a kind of a prototype, right? uh, a, 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 an innovative way of envisioning modern Chinese Buddhist education, um, following a carefully constructed um, curriculum, the doctrine and philosophy of all Buddhist schools, ideally, right? uh, as well as secular subjects, were taught in a classroom setting, just like this, you know, um, <clears throat> probably not you know, with a projector, but you, you get the idea, right? Uh, desk, chairs, the teacher standing in the front, um, blackboard, um, students were given text um, you know, to uh, study, um, and you know, exams, um, diplomas at graduation, and so on. Things that we told so taken for granted today, but things were considered groundbreaking and innovative, you know, back then in the 1920s. Um, frequent assignments and evaluations, uh, and so on. <clears throat> so, I identified then, you know, in evaluating the kind of like legacies and, and, and impact of what I would call the Wu Chang model, right? I identified several paradigm shifts. And to me, you know, these are the reasons why Wu Chang um, was so important in n not just the self-understanding, you know, of Chinese Buddhist history, um, but also in sort of like, you know, propelling forward um, a modernization project. Okay. So, and therefore, um, I also suggest viewing Wu Chang or the Wu Chang Academy, as the origin of not just a network of schools and graduates, but a modern lineage whose identity was constantly shaped and reshaped by its participants in response to situations both within and outside of Buddhism. So then, you know, the Academy marks three paradigm shifts um, that has a long-lasting impact in the practice of modern Chinese Buddhism. The first is what I called a redefinition of a teacher-student relationship, which is vertical, okay, um, in which um, the relationship <coughs> between a teacher and a student um, was reinterpreted. So scholars of Chinese Buddhism have long recognized that due to a lack of, the lack of a centralized authority, more or less throughout the history of Chinese Buddhism, um, the tradition has historically been held together by informal networks of affiliation um, that were centered around religious kinship, charismatic monks, and regionalism. 
So at first glance then, the vertical teacher-student relationship, you know, that can be found within the Buddhist academies, um, really was not that dissimilar, right, to this system of affiliation, right? Um, for instance, Taishi was surrounded by, you know, um, his Tonsho disciples, um, students as his academies, and lay people, you know, who like, you know, follow him, and those who revered him for his charisma. But the point of departure from the traditional norms of affiliation found within these academies lies in the message of some of these teachings, you know, especially the ones by Taishi. Um, he called on people to participate in the world as a form of Buddhist activism. Okay? And more importantly, sometimes people identify with him and his messages without prior personal contact with him. You know, they could, you know, have, say, read something, you know, that he wrote, identify strongly with his teaching, and some of them, you know, would travel to his schools and enrolled, but some of them remained, I guess, you know, distant. Um, so, and then, of course, um, the Buddhist academies then, you know, um, I think the, serves as a kind of like ideological um, uh, uh, ground for a lot of Tai Chi's uh, reformist idea. Um, and in the setting of the academies, sometimes people have multiple teacher-students relationship. Just imagine taking, you know, like, six different subjects, right? Then you have, you know, um, various teachers with whom you developed, right, this uh, teacher-student relationship. Um, so, and secondly, right, we are talking about the, Im the reimagination right, of a horizontal student-monk uh, community. Okay. And this is also arguably the most significant influence of the Fo Xue Yuan on the overall practice and self-identity of modern Chinese Buddhism. Okay. So already, right, at the turn of the 20th century, we saw the emergence of a group of young monastics who thought of themselves as members of a unique community, distinct from the rest of the Chinese Sangha, at a time when the socio-political discourse was dominated by ideas such as democracy, freedom, liberty, equality, um, republicanism, and so on and so forth. So these young monks were eager to demonstrate that they were capable of becoming new monk, in a way, right, um, for the nation. And here I would also like to add that, let's take a step back <coughs> right, and try to think of students. Um, again, right, something that we encounter on a daily basis at a university, right, something that we think often, right, as a neutral category. A student is a student. A student is someone who comes to your class. A student is someone who wants to give you a lot of headaches, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, going back to the context of 20th century China, okay, I would like to echo, um, you know, scholars such as Fabio Lanza, right, in saying that students, um, at least for the 20th century China, right, um, was really a highly political and very, very, very politicized um, category. Okay. Um, just think the May 4th in 1919, you know, to June 4th in 19. 89, right? students you know, were actively engaged in the debate of what does it mean to be Chinese, what does it mean to be educated, and you know, so on and so forth, right? And students were also the ones who were like, you know, very critical of politics, right? Um, of, I guess, you know, various um, social norms, and so on and so forth. So now, coming back to you know, the Buddhist academies, I would say that you can pretty much apply everything that we've just said right, to the monks who were enrolled at these academies. Okay. Um, so the student monks then right, are the ones who attended modern Buddhist academies, play, uh, paid close attention to social and political issues, 
regularly voice harsh criticism of the traditional uh, you know, Buddhist establishment. Um, um, so, student monks, I'll repeat, they attend modern Buddhist academies, paid close attention to social political issues, regularly voice harsh criticism uh, of the traditional Buddhist establishment, and constantly articulated their ideas for revitalizing Buddhism in newspapers and periodicals. Okay. The 1920s and 30s was also a period when you see hundreds and, you know, and hundreds of Buddhist periodicals and magazines and newspapers being published um, across China. Okay. Um, so I think the print culture and the Buddhist uh, modernization movement actually, you know, uh, were sort of like hand in hand. Okay. So the locale for the production of this collective identity then, you know, um, <clears throat> was very often associated with, but not limited to, the Buddhist Studies the Academy. Okay. And it is also, you know, worth noting that um, this Ver, um, this horizontal student monk's identity that I'm referring to earlier okay, um, consisted of both the physical component, the Buddhist academies, right, and an abstract one um, circulated through you know, these periodicals. Members of this imagined community were constantly engaged <coughs> in the debate on you know the future outlook of Chinese Buddhism, um, whether you know Buddhists should participate you know in politics, um, how do you invoke the language of right to defend you know Buddhist properties, and so on and so forth. So it was in this continuous competition, tension, clashes, and negotiation that young monks in China generated a vision of collective belonging. So to reiterate, you know, I'd say that uh, the emergence of uh, uh, the student monk as a collective identity right, um, was one of the most important impact of these Fuxue Yuan in the 20s and 30s. It is often said that uh, a picture is worth, you know, <laughs> a thousand words. So here I'm going to show you two pictures hopefully worth like 2,000 words, um, to give you an idea of what I mean by a modern Fu Xue Yuan educated student monk. Compare and contrast. So this is a photo of a very, very, very revered Chan monk, um, Xu Yun. Um, he lived 120 years almost. Okay. Um, one of the most important Buddhist teachers in modern Chinese Buddhism. If you do look at this picture of him, he looks away from the camera, and, uh, and you know, the, uh, 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 you don't really, you know, look, uh, it was not frontal, right? It was the photo was taken from the site. So there is a certain degree of disengagement and distance. Um, because this is the ideal of an enlightened Buddhist teacher, right? That he doesn't, you know, he's not like you and me, right? Um, he's far away, right? And look at, look at his eyes, right? His eyes is closed. These are what I mean by student monks. It was 1949. Graduates of the Jing'an Buddhist Academy in Shanghai monks who actually went to a photo studio, right, probably selected the background, right, posed for the photo, pretty confident, right, and looked into the camera. I personally find, you know, um, this particular photo really intriguing and it really captures, right, in a way, um, what does it mean, right? Or what does it mean for these monks, right, to be modern, right, and educated? Huh? Oh, 
yeah, it was probably, you know, the day before shaving day. So you know, they all have much longer <laughs> hair. <laughs> huh? Yeah, strictly speaking, not long hair. Uh, no, no. I, actually, they're all monks. Yeah. I think it's just that, you know, their hair was long because um, how, like, in, uh, you know, traditional monastery, you have, like, you know, fixed shaving days. Uh, you know, every 15th or every 10 days, depending on the schedule. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I let my hair go like 15 days. Maybe it'll be as long as theirs. <laughs> so, um, and another really interesting thing right, to point out is that we're talking about people, again, you know, familiar names of those of us who are familiar with modern Chinese Buddhism, Sheng Yan right, and Liao Zhong, uh, Miao Feng, and I haven't been able to identify the other two. Sheng Yan founded the Dharma Drum Sangha, which founded eventually the Dharma Drum um, Liberal Art College. Right? Um, Liao Zhong founded um, Xianzhang University, one of the first Buddhist universities in Taiwan. Okay? So, a redefined or reinterpreted teacher-student relationship and a reimagined uh, or I would say you know uh, a, a brand new um, student monk identity right, was um, deeply grounded um, in a reconstruction or reformulation of orthodoxy. Okay. Buddhist educators and young monks derived their authority and legitimacy from this renewed Buddhism right, that, uh, that uh, the uh, Buddhist Academy represented. Okay. Um, external to the monastic establishments as well, these student monks were eager to remind the laity that the longevity of Buddhism depending on the laity's appropriate support right, for not just any Buddhist institution, but their type of Buddhist institution. Right? So in other words, what is so interesting in this case is that a comprehensive education right, represented by the Buddhist Academy um, provided the kind of legitimacy so, and maybe I could take a step back and talk, you know, a little bit about um, how clerical training was done prior to the emergence of these academies, okay? So traditionally, um, a Chan monk or someone who wanted to engage in meditative practice would travel to a big monastery usually one that is famous for its Chan or meditation practice. Right? And if he was lucky enough, he would be able to you know, get admitted into the meditation hall right? and spend, who knows, years and years and years in there right? until he was recognized by the teacher as someone who has attained right? the essence of say meditative practice or Chan Buddhism and then he might be able right, to receive transmission and hence recognition by that teacher and he would be able to as a result then right, teach as a Chan master and in a different instance um, a young usually newly ordained monk um, who was interested in doctrinal learning would again travel to um, a famous monastery or a famous teacher and usually you know a teacher who was famous for teaching or preaching a particular sutra or text okay. then this monk would learn from that famous teacher that particular text for a certain number of years until he is recognized as, I guess, good enough at it, right? And then with the blessing of the teacher, right, he would be able to then, you know, go off, you know, and preach as an authority and usually, you know, an authority of that particular text 
or a particular school right or body of text until maybe eventually when it's good enough at it you know when it's done you know uh, that in long enough then he might be able to sort of like you know move on to like you know out of Buddhist text and so on right? so in other words um, both in terms of meditative practice and preaching right? um, we are talking about leadership and the role as teacher more or less reserved for a very small and select group of elitist monks. Okay? So the idea of a Buddhist academy then, um, all the way from its curriculum to how instruction okay, was done, um, represented something that is entirely different. Right? Um, Buddhism, first of all, the tradition itself was divided into various subjects. Um, I caution here every time I show something like that, um, because these things are like widely available, right? You go into um, the uh, periodicals, uh, and they're all actually published in these periodicals, right? Uh, along with uh, the charter of uh, these academies. And I often like to caution people by saying that, however perfect this seems, um, we should really think of these as aspirations instead of fact. In other words, ideally, this would be the curriculum. Um, but very often, when you really try and read the history of a particular uh, uh, academy, you would find that um, often they couldn't find a teacher to teach a certain subject, and often, you know, they find that uh, the uh, students lacked preparations and competence to, you know, um, catch up with, um, you know, the curriculum and so on. Right. Um, so that being said, if we come back and look at the first year curriculum, okay, um, and this is for the uh, Minan Buddhist Academies, you know, in uh, uh, Xiamen, Fujian. Right? Buddhism is divided into these various schools, various uh, schools of philosophies, right, and various texts, um, and various subjects as well. You have the Shurangama Sutra, right, the awakening of faith in the Mahayana, and then you also have so kind of like introductory course on Buddhism that is supposed to cover, I don't know, you know, Buddhist history. And, uh, you know, an, another very commonly found um, uh, course is Indian Buddhism or Indian Buddhist philosophy, okay? Um, Buddhist logic, Chinese composition, language courses, right? Foreign language from English to Japanese to Sanskrit to Tibetan, again, aspirational. Uh, Sanlun commentaries like Yogacara, right? Prajnaparamita, uh, again Indian, you know, uh, Buddhism, uh, introduction to Indian religion, and so on. Um, and eventually, we also see the addition of art, music, history, um, and into the late 1920s and the, the Nanjing period, um, KMT, you know, party doctrine, and so on. And, you know, up until the present day, you know, you find even more subject added, right, such as management, computer, um, you know, psychology, um, and so on, right. So, in, I guess, um, rethinking about what I was saying about uh, the reformulation of orthodoxy, right, um, I think a curriculum like this doesn't just redefine learning and instruction right, in Chinese Buddhism, but it also gives the Chinese Buddhists a different way, very, very different from traditional clerical training in thinking about their own tradition and the, the various, you know, elements and components that makes up their tradition, right? Um, so then um, it Something like that also provided um, authority and orthodoxy for, for you know, any graduates of these Buddhist academies to claim that they are not just a preacher or a teacher of a particular text, 
because they have this very comprehensive right, knowledge and training in Buddhist philosophy and history and secular subject. Right? So, so to me, you know, that is where the redefinition of orthodoxy comes from. Okay? Again, something that might appear really, you know, nothing extraordinary. Um, something that was issued in 1948, right? Again, to Sheng Yan, the founder of um, the Dharma Drum Order, right? He graduated uh, from um, um, the Jing An Buddhist Academy in Shanghai, and uh, he was awarded a diploma. Okay? Those of you who are familiar with traditional um, transmission of legitimacy and authority in Buddhism. Um, I'm not sure if you think of immediately the Dharma transmission scroll. Right. So traditionally, when a teacher recognizes a student, right, um, he would you know, um, transmit the lineage to this particular you know, student by offering him a Dharma transmission scroll. Right? And that Dharma transmission scroll right, would have the names of everyone in the lineage right, going back to the Buddha. Right? And this is where legitimacy to teach is derived. Right? But into the modern time, as I said, you know, nothing extraordinary in terms of you know, like secular education. Um, but you now have monks going around right, with a diploma and claiming power and legitimacy to teach because they have attended, you know, one of these academies. Okay. So, um, in the nutshell, then, right, um, these three paradigm shifts okay, has allowed the student monks right, to really reimagine um, a way to be a Buddhist um, in the modern context. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have another 20 minutes, so I'm very going to very quickly, uh, perhaps you know, go over to talk about because you know often you talk about these things, and uh, and as you know you can see most of these schools right were active in the 1920s and and 30s, right, uh, and then during the war, right, uh, the Second Sino-Japanese War, most of them have shut down. Okay, so then you know the usual question would be, all right. So you have all these schools who are active for a year or two or three, and then you know they have all shut down eventually. Um, so why should I care? <laughs> why should we care about this short-lived, this sort of like burst, right, of uh, Buddhist educational reform? Um, what happens now, and what are the continuities and the legacies, right, that can be traced back to this particular period? So. Um, actually, since this particular period, the Fu Xue Yuan has become like almost the default way of training, you know, clergy member um, in Chinese Buddhism. Um, aside from perhaps you know the uh, uh, Sino-Japanese War period. And then also, uh, you know, the Civil War period, uh, and so on. So I'm going to um, perhaps tell us, you know, about uh, its various development in Taiwan and in China, and then, you know, to come back and talk about, I guess, the overall impact of, of this particular system. So um, in Taiwan, um, Buddhism right, experienced a period of rapid growth. Um, after the end of martial law in 1987. Okay. So Buddhist academies then, you know, in Taiwan or Fu Xue Yuan, um, were among, I guess, you know, um, the fastest growing institution within Taiwanese Buddhism. Many Buddhist uh, temples and monasteries founded academies throughout the island. Okay. And into the 1990s, a series of educational reform acts by the Taiwanese government right, has also allowed 
the founding of Buddhist universities. Um, in the 1990s into the you know, early 2000s, uh, many private, I guess, uh, educational institutions who weren't uh, recognized as uh, universities are now able to um, upgrade and become universities. Okay. In the 1980s, there were only 40 universities, around 40 in Taiwan, and today I think there are like about 150. You know, in the small island of Taiwan. Okay, so during the Q and A, we can come back and talk about the challenge that these Buddhist universities face. So, in the in that period, right between the 90s and the 2000s, um, an important change, you know, on the island of Taiwan in terms of you know Buddhist uh, uh, the Buddhist institutions is that you also see you know um, uh, the emergence or the founding of quite a number of Buddhist universities as a result of the government policy that now allowed Fu um, Xue uh, Yuan uh, to become uh, Buddhist universities. So currently there are six of them, six Buddhist universities in Taiwan. Okay, um, and a lot of these teachers actually got their inspirations when they were student monks themselves, right, from Japanese sectarian university. Okay, so during the Q and A, we can talk about then in what ways are they like. Japanese sectarian universities, and in what ways are they trying to not define themselves as sectarian, and what's the catch in doing so and not doing so? Okay. Now, uh, in mainland China, okay, many uh, Buddhist academies, most of them actually, uh, closed. Uh, after 1949 and also throughout the Cultural Revolution. But then gradually, quite a number of them uh, reopened at the end of the Cultural Revolutions and into the 80s and 90s. Okay. Uh, now, the uh, Buddhist academies in China uh, are kind of managed uh, and controlled by not just the uh, Chinese Buddhist Association, but also, you know, with the approval of the state administrative, uh, the state administration for religious affairs. In mainland China, the Buddhist academies have now become the default institution for clerical training, producing for Chinese Buddhism um, administrators um, at large monasteries. In fact, big monasteries in China would have to go to like Buddhist academies to recruit, you know, administrators. Right? Um, and these academies also produce, you know, for Chinese Buddhism, the kind of like elitist um, Buddhist studies uh, scholars. Right? Uh, what you are seeing here, um, I think I'm going to try and end here, and then perhaps you know talk more uh, about the various aspect of what I've just shown you during the Q and A. Um, so just to perhaps very, very, very quickly conclude, um, in the construction, the imagination, and the reimagination, and negotiation for what a Chinese Buddhist would today call modern Buddhism, okay, I would argue that education, right, or Fu Xue Yuan, remains at the very, very heart of such project. Okay. So um, I think I will like stop here and then take some questions. Thanks for your attention.